We're in a series called Unstoppable, and as Christians, many of us here today, we believe that we are unstoppable, that with God's help and with God's encouragement in our lives, then all things are possible uh, as we read in Philippians. Today, I want to just kind of bring out this tension that happens for you, I would imagine, just like it happens for me. And and it's really a tension between immediate gratification and delayed gratification. On your outline today, you'll notice our topic is delayed gratification. And let me tell you how this fleshes itself out quite often in our lives, this tension of immediate gratification. Uh, Often it comes out in ways like health. Uh, For me, I struggle with working out. How many of you would say you struggle with that, that it's kind of a battle for you? I mean, you know in the long term it's the best thing for you, and yet when the alarm clock goes off or the time reaches, the time to leave and go to the gym, you just kind of cringe, right? Anybody else do that? Um, But we know in the long term that that's the best thing for us. Relationships. If you've been in dating relationships in the past, or maybe you're in a dating relationship now, and you... You're just not sure if it's the right person or should I make a big commitment to this person? And you're, you kind of have that tension. Is it an immediate gratification or is this going to be a long-term kind of relationship? Now, my wife could give a testimony on this today. She, I won't call her up to do this, but uh, she was around a lot of frogs for a number of years in her dating life. And then she met her prince. And uh, she'll kill me for that later. But that immediate gratification versus that delayed gratification. We do this in the area of shopping. Ladies, maybe you can relate to this. Guys, maybe you can relate to this as well. Um, We go into the store and um, our immediate nature says, hey, I've got to have that. And yet we think about the credit card bill or we think about the bills that will come flooding into the mailbox. and, And there's that tension again, the immediate versus kind of the long term. It comes out in other ways as well. I'm kind of in the moment uh, counting calories, and I started that at the new year. And so throughout the day, I just kind of keep a a head calculation going on with how many calories I eat during the day. And and I just realized that that's going to be good for me long term if I can keep the calories down. But yet then I walk into a restaurant or I see some chicken wings on a commercial or for me, it's chicken wings, potato chips, and peanuts. That, I mean, when I see those, it's kind of, golly, this stinks. I can't have those. Uh, somebody said this, a moment on the lips is what? A lifetime on the hips. And so, again, you have that immediate gratification versus the delayed gratification. So today, we're just going to give you a working definition here of delayed gratification. Here's what it is. Saying no to something now in order to have something better later. It's saying no to something now in order to have something better later. And in Scripture, we find this a number of different times. Um, We find God telling people to wait, to hold off, because there's something better for you to come. Um, And often in our lives, I'm pretty confident God is just telling us, wait, don't jump at your first opportunity. This isn't your best shot This is not the best that I have for you. And yet we wrestle with that and wrestle with that and wrestle with that. And and so today we're just going to kind of hit it head on and and just kind of come to God and say, God, how can we make those decisions and choices in a way that brings you glory? If you got your Bible today, I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis 41. And we're going to read a story about a guy named Joseph. And we're going to catch just a, a snippet of his life and a story that he's a part of. And I want you to see how he just kind of grapples with the same things that you grapple with and the same things that I grapple with. Now, let me give you a setup, kind of a background story on Joseph. If you remember, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. His brothers were jealous of him, and at some point they had had enough, and they said, Joseph, you're out. And they kind of threw him into a pit, if you remember all that, and then finally they sold him into slavery. Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and literally, he began to walk like an Egyptian and talk like an Egyptian. He kind of lived that out. Uh, He was an Israelite, but he became 
integrated with the Egyptian culture. If you remember, he got some authority. The Pharaoh acknowledged that he was a strong leader. He was able to interpret dreams. The Pharaoh said, hey, I need you at the top with me. He became a high authority in the nation of Egypt. He got into some trouble. We won't go through all that. Um, But they knew he interpreted dreams. And so the story we're reading today, um, there's a dream that comes to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh needs somebody to interpret that dream. And so it kind of comes through the pipeline that, hey, this guy Joseph is good at interpreting dreams. And so they bring Joseph, and, and here was the dream that Joseph interpreted for the Pharaoh. Um, he said, you're, the nation of Egypt is going to have seven years of abundance, meaning that in our nation, there'll be plenty of food for seven years. The harvest will be plentiful. But for the next seven years, there's going to be virtually nothing. There'll be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. And so Joseph is given the task, well, what do we do? The Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, what do we do with this? Well, Joseph devises this brilliant plan. Here was his plan. We're going to consume less. We're going to kind of back off of our consumerism here. We're going to consume less grain, and we're going to store it up in barns and in storehouses. Um, We're going to store for the first seven years so that the last seven years will be fine. And he comes up with this brilliant plan, and this brilliant plan, as we're going to notice in this story, ends up saving the nation of Egypt. And actually, it goes even further than that. It actually saves the world, the people of the world. And so as we look at the life of Joseph, he understood this principle that we're talking about today. Delayed gratification versus immediate gratification. And in his life, he realized that there are times and there are situations where we have to back up and say, you know what, I don't want to spend all that money. I don't want to incur all that debt. Or I don't want to settle for a relationship that's not the relationship that I need to be in. And so Joseph, in his life, he lived this out, and hopefully today as we read this story, it'll apply to you and apply to me. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time this morning. Father, we thank you that we can come to this place, and we can honor you, we can praise you, but also, God, we can learn from you. Your word is so practical for us, it's so relevant. There's so many lessons in your word that can help us. Um, lives lives that honor you. And so, to Lord, today I pray as we open up your word that you'll speak to us, that you'll do something in our lives in a way that nobody else can, only you can. So, God, we just praise you and honor you in Christ's name. Amen. On your outline today, I want you to notice, number one, um, we can show restraint. Number one, we can show restraint. I want to read, if you've got your outline with us, I, I want us to kind of read through this. And I want you to see how Joseph was able Um, not only personally to show restraint, but then he encouraged the whole nation of Egypt to show restraint. So here we go. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentiful. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of an abundance in Egypt, and he stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the field surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began just as Joseph had said. There was famine all over the lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to fill the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread all over the country, Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. Now, I want you to hear this last verse. And all of the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was so severe everywhere. Um, In that last verse, notice what we find. The nation of Egypt, they they begin to store, and they would put grain in these storehouses, and the grain became so much, we find here in these verses here in your outline, that it was like the sand of the sea. How many of you would like to be at the sand of the sea right now? That'd be nice, right? On a warm beach, that'd be nice, right? Um, But there was so much that it was like the sand of the sea. It, It was so much that they stopped keeping records. Notice that? Um, meaning that their calculator didn't have that many buttons. There was so much grain, and the people were so efficient in those first seven years 
um, that there was plenty of grain to be stored that they couldn't even count it. Now, let's go back to those first seven years because I'm sure there were a lot of, uh, a lot of upheaval in those first seven years. I'm sure there was some frustration of the people of Egypt. Uh, what do you mean, Joseph, we're going to store this much food? Joseph, we don't even have this many storehouses. Joseph, we can't even count the grain. What are we doing here? Joseph, why would we spend this much energy and this much space? And what is this really going to be in the end? And I'm sure there was a lot of, of griping. I'm sure there was a lot of complaining. And, and I'm sure there were people kind of whispering in Joseph's ears, man, are you sure this is going to work? Joseph, do we really have to do all of this? Joseph, is this really that important that we need to use all this effort and all this energy to store up this grain? But I can just kind of see Joseph coming back at those people and saying, just wait. Just wait. There's something good to come. I believe that God looks at you and I quite often and says that same thing. Just wait. There's something good to come. Uh, what we find in Genesis and what we find in the life of Joseph, and we find a phrase that's repeated a number of different times. And the phrase is, and God was with Joseph. And you see it so many times, it's, it's almost wild. Because over and over when you read about Joseph's life, you see that phrase, and God was with Joseph. But you're going to notice that was a great thing. That, that God was with Joseph and he got this vision and he interpreted this dream and he, he went to the nation of Egypt and he said, hey, you can't eat all this food. You got to store up a bunch of food. And so the nation of Egypt, they did this. They showed restraint. Dave Ramsey says this about maturity. Maturity is learning to delay pleasure. Children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan and follow it. And that's what Joseph told the nation of Egypt. Listen. We got to delay some pleasure. You're not going to be able to eat all the extra grain. You're not going to be able to eat in abundance for these seven years. We've got to show restraint. We've got to get our lives in check. We can't go over and above and beyond what like we've always done. For these seven years, we've got to pump the brakes. We got to pull it back. Well, the nation of Egypt responded. And we see that the grain came in and they were able to store all of this grain. They showed a lot, a lot of restraint. Now, um, I enjoy the show. Anybody watch the show Shark Tank? Anybody watch that show? I enjoy that show. Me and my little boy, he's here in here this morning. Uh, we enjoy that show together sometimes. And uh, we actually, one day, would like to go on that show, right, Camden? Um, we want to create some products. You know, we think that would be fun to go on Shark Tank, sell our products, get that million-dollar check, and then... Go retire, right? Um, well, here's, our, here's my first product, okay? I'm calling this the delay spray. The delay spray. Uh, how you like the uh, kind of packaging? You like that? Pretty good stuff. Here's how the delay spray works. Um, the delay spray works like if you have kids, you have grandkids, and they say, hey, I want to eat candy for lunch. I just want to eat candy for lunch. You go, no, nope. <laughs> no candy for lunch. <laughs> delay spray. Or, or maybe with my little boy, you know, hey, I want to go outside and play all day in the rain. Nope, delay spray. <laughs> there you go. Or, or maybe I need some delay spray. Maybe my wife says, hey, you, <laughs> you, you need to quit eating so much. Okay, delay spray. I'll quit eating so much, you know. My wife, how, never mind, I'm not going to go there. I won't say. <laughs> no delay spray for her. Uh, how about with your boss? Wouldn't that be nice? How many of you like to take the delay spray in tomorrow to work? Hey, Jenny, go and do such and such. Nope, delay spray. <laughs> How about with our, our government? It'd be nice to grab a bunch of buckets full of this with our government, right? You like that? You, you want to spend all my money? Okay, delay spray. <laughs> but How about the delay spray? Wouldn't that be nice to kind of take along with us wherever we go, in whatever situations we're in? I think God would love to have the delay spray on us. 
when we want to make some boneheaded, immediate, gratifying decision, I'm sure he'd love to just say, uh-uh, <laughs> not happening. And yet, we can show restraint. Um, in Scripture, we learn that the Holy Spirit is in all Christians. Remember, I told you that in Joseph's life, it said, and God was with Joseph. Well, for those of us that are Christians, God is always with us. The Holy Spirit is always in us. And when we go and we try to make immediate gratifying decisions, the Holy Spirit can pull us back and say, no, that's not the right decision. And so for many of us, we really just need to ask God for help. Uh, God, I'm trying to make this decision. And, and is this an immediate gratifying decision, God, or is this a long-term decision? Is this something that will honor you, is this, or is this something that won't honor you? And God, I need your help. God, help me figure this out. God, help me get a handle on this. So number one, we can show restraint. Part of the Holy Spirit's job in our life is to pull us back from those decisions and choices that we might not should make. So number one, uh, we can show restraint. Number two, we can think long term. One of the things you're going to notice about Joseph is that he didn't just think about today. The nation of Egypt, they didn't just think about today. Instead, they figured out real quick that we're going to have to begin to think about the long term. Um, these first seven years, whatever we do in these seven years, are going to be important in those next seven years. And so that's what we find here on your outline, these next set of verses. Notice what we find here. It says, the seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was a famine in all the other lands. But in the whole land of Egypt, look at this. Don't miss these last three words. Catch those last. Matter of fact, let's just say these last three words together. There was food. Let's say that again. There was food. You see how that works? Joseph had convinced the nation of Egypt, hey, we can't just consume, we can't just go for the immediate. We've got to back up and say, you know what, it's, it's more about the long term. It's more about what's going to happen in the future. It's more about, am I making a choice or a decision today that's going to harm my future, or is it going to help my future? Craig Rochelle says it this way, we need to focus less on today's happiness and more on tomorrow's readiness. I agree with that. Let me say that again. That's good stuff. We need to focus less on today's happiness and more on tomorrow's readiness. Wayne Gretzky was the great hockey player in the 80s and maybe even into the late 70s. Wayne Gretzky was head and shoulders above most every other hockey player of his era. One time he was interviewed by someone and they asked him, what's the difference between you and everybody else? I mean, it's almost like you're the varsity and they're the JV. And here's what he said, and, and it means a lot to us as Christians. He said this, most people skate to where the puck is, the hockey puck is. I skate to where the hockey puck is going to be. And for us believers, for us Christians, we can't just worry about the moment. We can't just worry about the instant have to look at our lives and say, God, where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? Not where am I at at this moment, not what decision do I need to make now, but God, where do you want me to end up? And so for many of us, we have to ask a simple question. And uh, this, if you would, write this down. There's nothing magical about this question, but it's a question that if we'll ask ourselves every day or we'll ask ourselves constantly, it'll, it'll help us get where, get where God wants us to go. Here's the question. What is my best long-term decision? What is my best long-term decision? Maybe you're coming in today and you have a decision to make. And you're grappling or you're wrestling with that decision and you're trying to decide which way to go. One way is a watershed moment here and the other is a watershed moment there. And you're grappling with that decision. We'll run it through the grid of this question. What is my best long-term decision? What is my best long-term decision. So number one, we can show restraint. Number two, we can think long term. And then number three, notice this, we can leave a legacy. We can leave a legacy. I'm convinced that this story could be a great movie. If somebody were to get the right actors and get the right directors and producers, I, I think that this story could be a, 
a fantastic movie because it has all the elements. It has tension. It has a resolution. It has an epic end. And let me show you the epic end because it gets really good here. If you got your Bible, um, it's verse 57 on your notes. It's the last verse uh, on your notes. It says this, verse 57. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. Number three, we can leave a legacy. Joseph did that. Joseph wasn't even an Egyptian. He was sold into slavery and he was sent down to Egypt and he spent a lot of his life in Egypt. And, but remember, God was with Joseph. Joseph heard God's message to, to save the grain. He saved the grain. The seven years of abundance came and that went great. The seven years of famine came and guess what? That turned out well also. But it would have never turned out well had Joseph not have been about legacy. If, he would have, if Joseph would have worried about the moment, if he would have worried about the day, the here and the now, it would have never have happened. And so for many of us, we, we take that lesson as well. Uh, somebody, if they were to ask Joseph back in these times, Joseph, what did you do today? He could literally say, I saved the world. Because he did. He saved the world. Notice again what it says. All the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. The solidified world at that time, they were going through this famine as well. And I'm sure they were frustrated and they were trying to figure out solutions. And, and the only guy that had prepared for this was Joseph and the Pharaoh of Egypt. And so they come from all around, all around, to gather the food from Joseph. Let me give you a statement. Impetuous and, and impulsive people don't change the world. Legacy people do. Impetuous and impulsive decisions don't change the world. Legacy decisions do. And so the question for you and I becomes, am I going to be kind of a legacy kind of guy or girl? Or am I going to be about the immediate gratification? Because we all bump up against that. That's a tension that we all face. Constantly in our lives, we're kind of weighing those things out. Is it going to be about the immediate or the delay? Is it going to be about the now or the future? Am I making decisions today that will be best for the long term? I'll tell you a story about a guy here, and then I'll be finished. There's a guy here at our church. He started coming a couple years ago. If you were to check his arrest record, he's been arrested almost 80 times. He will tell you stories that you just are amazed at. I enjoy just sitting across the table from him and listening to his story. He tells a story of being here in Atlanta. He had gotten involved with some people that were dangerous people. He was a dangerous person. He said that either he needed to kill somebody or they needed to kill him. And that instead of murder happening, he decided to get out of town. He got on a bus and he went out of town for a while. We got in trouble again. One of the 70-something times he had been in prison. He was in prison and he came to Christ. In prison, that changed his life. He had a vision in prison to serve God. In that prison, he knew that he couldn't go back and be the same person that he was before. So this guy, he got out of prison. He began to, to, to get involved in church and, and, and began to just kind of relate to Christ and to look to God for help in his life. Today, he's part of one of our ministries here. He's on the road constantly, 24-7, it almost seems like. Serving God, helping people. That's what he loves to do now. His dad died about a year, year and a half ago. On his dad's deathbed, he was able to look at his son who had been arrested all these many times and just gone through all this heartache and all of this pain. And on his deathbed, his dad said to him, I'm proud of you for what you've become. I'm proud of you for what you've become. This guy went from impetuous and impulsive and immediate gratification kind of stuff to saying, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I want to be a legacy guy. I want to be a man of legacy. And it kind of brings to your heart and maybe brings to my heart today that we need to be legacy people. We need to look at our lives and look at the people's lives around us that we influence and say, is it just going to be about the moment or am I going to focus on the long term? 
Is it just going to be about today or is it going to be about the future as well? I don't want to make decisions today that are going to harm my future. I want to make decisions today that are helpful for my future. Joseph became a legacy guy. The nation of Egypt, their history is, is centered around what he did back in this time. Had he not done what he did, if he had not listened to God, there may not have been the similar kind of Egypt that there is now. But Joseph was a legacy guy. Let me kind of paint a picture for you today and then we'll be done. What, what if in your family you said, you know what, we're going to be a legacy family. We're not going to be an immediate gratification kind of family. I'm going to teach my kids that it's not about the moment, it's about the long term. What if in your family you said we're going to be a legacy family? What if at your job, maybe you're an employer, um, what if you said at, at, at this company, we're going to be about legacy? Um, we're going to be about the, the long term and not the immediate. What if in our church we said, you know what, we're going to be legacy people? We're not just going to be focused on today or, or the moment or the now, but we're instead, we're going to be focused on the long term. We're going to run through the grid all our decisions through what is the Long term, the best long term decision. What if, as a church, what is it if a community, what if a nation, as a nation, we said, you know, we're going to be a legacy nation? I mean, we already are a legacy nation in a number of ways, but what if we recommitted ourselves and said, you know what, we're going to be a legacy nation? We're not going to worry just about the immediate and the now and today, but we're going to worry about the future as well. So that kind of brings out that tension for you and I again. So here's the question for you today. Is there something in your life where you're struggling with or maybe you're making a decision on and you have to run it through the grid? What's the best long-term decision here? What is my best long-term decision? Are you going to be a legacy person? Are you going to be a legacy family? Are you going to be a legacy company? Or are you going to be an immediate gratification kind of company, family, nation, because we noticed in the life of Joseph, boy, legacy is where it's at. Legacy is where it's at. Let's bow our heads together, and I want to challenge you with a couple things today. First thing I want to challenge you with is if, if you've never come into a relationship with Christ, that's the best long-term decision you'll ever make. The Bible says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. If you've never come to Christ and you've never known Him as your Savior, would you today just make that decision? That certainly is the best long-term decision you can make. Just say something like this in your own heart and mind. Father, I'm a sinner, but today I'm putting my faith and trust in You. Save me a place in heaven when I die. If you're doing that today, I just want to pray for you with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're praying that prayer for the first time or just making that known for the first time today, would you just slip your hand up and slip it back down? Anybody today? God bless you. Anybody else? I may not see you, but I do want to pray for you. Slip your hand up and slip it back down. God bless you. For the rest of us, maybe you're dealing with a a decision or a choice or maybe you're kind of at that crossroads and you're struggling immediate gratification long term gratification I want to pray for you here in just a moment but if there's something I can pray for you about would you just slip your hand up slip it back down I'll pray for you God bless you alright anybody else God bless you I, I don't know exactly what's going on in your heart but I can certainly pray for you anybody else I want you to pray for me as I make a long-term decision, the best long-term decision. God bless you. Father, we, we all bump up against this. It's common with all men and women. Do I make a decision today that may or may not be the best decision, or do I look at the long-term and say, you know what, this is the best move long-term? In Scripture, we're so encouraged by Joseph because he listened to you. You were with him, and he listened to you. And he made a great long-term decision for the nation of Egypt. Lord, many of us are parents, or we're 
we have responsibilities and it's, it's, it's a big responsibility to, to kind of make these decisions and, and to focus on the long term. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, like you were with Joseph, please be with us. Help us. Speak to us in your own way and guide us in ways that are honoring and pleasing to you. And so God, we do praise you today. We, we just thank you for what you've done in our lives. I uh, thank you for the people that trusted you this morning. Do something big in their lives. God, again, we love you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen.